rights. It's nice to be back. Uh, I go back to prayers. I only had about three hours of sleep today. Not a good thing. But it's good to be back. At around 9 p.m. Uh, last night. Oh, we need to pray for the kids. Our Father in Heaven, we just want to uh, sustain the ministry fervor for our young people. Would you enable our teachers to be accurate, to be kind in disseminating the truth, and for the young ones to absorb everything that matters to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. As I was saying, uh, between 9 to 10 p.m. last night, uh, our plane was circling on top of the airport, uh, navigating away from the storm, uh, waiting for the appropriate time to land. And we were just up there. But the consolation was the perfect view of Dallas-Fort Worth. A stark contrast to the landscape of our beloved Manila. If you've been up here and your plane <coughs> is about to land at DFW, you cannot escape the stunning symmetry and the order of how things are done in the United States. And this perfect symmetry, the subdivisions of land, and the lake, and the school, uh, the football field, right smack in the center, and then the neighboring subdivisions. It's almost like a wonderful uh, work of art. But then, when you, when you approach Manila, especially at night, you are stunned, likewise, by the landscape. Because it's, it's, it's more of an abstraction. Because there's, there's no, no parallel symmetry. It's, it's like beauty, yes. But it's a different sort of beauty because it's, it's, it's like an abstraction, but nonetheless, it's, it's scintillating to the senses. Especially when it approaches the Manila Bay, which uh, is currently the hub of political and, and, and a social bus. Like something is happening. I just read from uh, the newspaper. Uh, a, a debate is currently brewing over the Manila Bay on, on an issue about a statue that's about to be erected. Uh, the Chinese Filipino community and the pilgrims from China gathered recently for a welcoming procession of the image of the Chinese uh, goddess of the sea. And the Chinese goddess of the, goddess of the sea, the name is Machu. Uh, and so the procession was from Binondo, Manila to the Carino Grandstand. And this was made possible through the Memorandum of Understanding, or the MOU, between the Friends of the Philippines Foundation and the Department of Tourism, so it's legit, planning to make the Philippines a Matsu festival hub and to build a Chinese Matsu cultural center in the Manila Bay with a Matsu statue, the goddess of the Chinese Sea, as their main attraction. So there's a strong possibility that as you approach the Manila Bay, you'll be distracted and not be able to see the spectacle of the abstraction. But instead, you'll be able to see a giant statue of a Chinese sea 
goddess. The question is, are you looking forward to that? Because to be sure, our neighbors, the Chinese, are so very much looking forward to that. I, I'm not making a political statement here, I'm just citing facts, because it seems like the debate is about why are you removing the proper God from our country? Those are the voices from the Filipino side. And the voices on, from the Chinese side are saying, what are you talking about? Isn't Matsu one of the legitimate gods, the goddesses? The title of the sermon today is rather unique. Can we post that up, please? It's about God. And we are in the Book of Romans. And the title is about removing God. Now I reckon that the issue of removing God is not only about the Manila Bay, but when I survey the current spiritual climate, not only in North America, but also in Manila and all over the world, I think it is it is not a misplaced generalization to say that the removal of God in the narrative of humans has become commonplace. In the universities, as a matter of fact, it has become fashionable to remove God from the discussions in the school system, removing God. In Romans 1.18, as we continue in our series, there is a heavy-duty uh, focus, hardcore focus, on the matter of removing God. Or the Apostle Paul uh, doesn't waste time, and doesn't mince his words in, in, in saying that if you are going to talk about the gospel, it's very important for you to know that you cannot understand the gospel not unless you begin with the context. And so we shall begin with the context. And the context of the gospel is quite unique. Because you, 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 we tend to think that because it's the gospel and, and God is set to redeeming humanity, then it ought to be, the gospel ought to be primarily a gospel that speaks about love, about care, about sweet kindness. But then we are thrown off because in the introduction of the gospel of Christ, we are introduced to a totally different slant. And here, our brother Romel just read it. So next slide, please. This is actually uh, Romans 1, 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's just the Greek version there. The first thing that I'd like to emphasize as we look at that passage is the concept of sin. There are actually three points. The first concept is sin. I'd like for you to look at that. The wrath of God. The wrath of God, by biblical definition, is focused against sin. We are told that it's revealed from heaven. That means it's not an act of thought. That God is totally against sin. By definition, all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. But if we are going to define sin, if we are going to ask ordinary people like us on what sin is, probably we will have different versions. 
And so in order for us to be helped, the Bible is very useful in clarifying definitions so that there will be no confusions. And so by definition, sin is anything that removes God from the center of all existence. You see, God doesn't mince His words when He declares that He is Creator God, that He is sovereign, that He runs, maintains, and sustains the universe and everything that's in it. He doesn't mince His words when He says that He has the operating manual on how each and every part and portion living or not, takes part in His creation. He says there's no other wise person who knows how the universe and persons inside ought to live because He made us. He's making the claim that specify, as far as human beings are concerned, there is a specific blueprint and a specific design on why you were crafted fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And there is a purpose. And the purpose is this. That God should never be removed. As a matter of fact, he claims that in order for humanity, for human lives to thrive, God must be central. We must receive all information, inputs, direction from our Creator, God, if we are to live well. And so to miss the point, and so to miss the mark, and to declare independence from God, and to claim that we know better than God, and to redefine what life is and its components, is defiantly rebellion against God. And so that is sin. And because God is perfect, He cannot contradict his, Himself. His very nature cannot contradict Himself. And so in His perfection, He has to be wrathful against sin. Why? Because He establishes that when we deviate from His wisdom, we are primarily attacking His person and His order. And by definition, that is defiant rebellion. And he knows that once we defy his person and his order, chaos will simply be the natural consequence. By the way, eternal consequence. Because this leads to death, not only physical, but spiritual. It leads to a life that is with no direction. It leads to a life that is not flourishing. It, it is a life that is totally cut off from the mercies and from the grace of God. And that is the reason why I hold the more God is angered when sin takes place. And so if you look at the history of humans, and if you search for evidence on the wrath of God against sin, comprehensive evidence, look at world history, it is so great that you will not be able to find a singular account of one segment of human history that does justice to the wrath of God. It is so great. No event 
provides justice to the magnanimity of God's wrath towards human sin. The only event, however, that provides a comprehensive evidence to the gravity of God's attitude towards sin is, is Gethsemane and Golgotha. Why? Because God declares that even if we cumulatively punish all human beings, it's not going to create a dent in the wrath of God. The only manner by which the wrath of God will be appeased, being Him perfect as it is closed, is if perfection heals the wound. So He sends His one and only begotten Son, His perfect Son. He takes the hit, the cosmic punishment. He pays the sin for humanity. He dies on the cross of Calvary. For us. We're looking for one evidence on how great the wrath of God is. Nothing comes closer than Golgotha, where Jesus died. And so we're establishing sin as the reason for the wrath of God. But then we have to move to the second one, please. There is symbiosis. Because we find in the verse, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against two matters. Against all ungodliness and against all unrighteousness. I'd like you to pay attention to to these two words, because when you look at the Word of God, it is so accurate and precise that it cuts through the bones and the marrows and the spiritual fabric of humans, because this is the most accurate and precise of all descriptions. It's telling us who we are and what's happening to us, who God is and why we are who we are, and what's, how, how can this be healed, how can this be resolved. And so we are told that there is symbiosis here. We are told that sin is present because of two symbiotic things. We might call them things. One is ungodliness on one hand, and one unrighteousness on one hand. Total ungodliness and total unrighteousness. These two are like brothers or sisters or a brother and a sister all ungodliness and all unrighteousness now let me ask you do you find any difference between those two just be saying them in the English language let me repeat that for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and against all unrighteousness. At first glance they seem very much alike. And sometimes when we read this passage, we breeze right through it without much thinking. But if you're Greek and you're looking at the Greek text, there's no way you'll breeze pass through it because the distinction is very obvious. Pasan, Asebeyan, Kai, Adikian. That's the Greek for all ungodliness and for all unrighteousness. In order for us to understand this concept, you will have to bring the Mount Sinai covenant where God gave two tablets to Moses. These are the things that matter most to me. And if you say that you worship me, you need to be sure that this has set in place. I give you two tablets. 
The verse tablets are matters concerning me that I do not appreciate any competition. So affections towards me, the way you relate to me, that's the first tablet. The first four commandments. And the last six commandments on the other side of the tablets are matters pertaining to your relations with others. So if you, if, if you, if you join those two, this is all about God, the first tablet, and the other one is all about being right with men. So godliness and righteousness, and you put them together, you have a complete picture. But you remove God from the equation, it becomes ungodliness. And once ungodliness takes place, of course, righteousness goes out of the window. And instead of righteousness, you have unrighteousness. So what's being said here is this. The symbiosis of ungodliness and unrighteousness. I hear this often from Christians uh, who are struggling. All of us are struggling, by the way. But I hear this often. Do you hear this from your peers? They say, you, you know, I don't understand myself. They sound like Paul, by the way. I know that God hates this thing. I have this sin in my life that keeps on recurring like a bad dream. I don't know why I keep on doing it. I know God hates it, but I still do it. Ah, I don't get it. I hate myself for it. But why is it that I can't help it? Why do I still keep on doing it? Does that happen to you? Do you have that sort of a thing? Or is it just me? Because I have that. I have, I have that. I have those moments in me. I have this one or several things in my life that I catch myself doing it again. And then I kind of like, why am I doing that again? And by the way, the Apostle Paul said that. I don't understand myself. The things that I hate, I keep on doing. You know the problem with that? <coughs> this has to do with symbiosis. Because the problem with that is once you have this sin problem that keeps on recurring, note that you are focusing on the second part of the tablet. You are focusing on righteousness. It is conduct and behavior. In the order of the text there, righteousness is the other half, part two. The first half is ungodliness. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve, which part do you think happened first? Unrighteousness or ungod uh, ungodliness? First, they were perfect, right? They were created perfect. They had no sin. And then something happened. So what do you think? What happened first? Did they become unrighteous first? Or they became ungodly first? Which came first? Yes, of course, it is so obvious. So what does that tell us? So fast forward, if that's Genesis, Adam and Eve were ungodly first, and because they were ungodly first, of course, they slid down to unrighteousness. Because they believe that they're better than God, they believe Satan and the serpent, uh, and the lie that they're better than God, they can declare and redefine their existence as humans. We are better than you, you are just... You don't want us to partake of the fruit there because you don't want us to be like you. Well, watch us because we're going to eat this fruit and we will become like you. And that's what they did. That is ungodliness. That is first class rebellion to the person of God. When you have rebellion to the person of God, what follows? You will, of course, rebel about the order of God. 
And so the, the reason why sin is, is like this, God's wrath is positioned against all ungodliness and against all unrighteousness is because much of the problem that we face with our conduct as Christians is this. We forget that the main source of our, our propensity to slide back to sin is, is actually ungodliness when we take God out of the equation. Because when we take God out of the equation, it doesn't matter how sophisticated uh, the replacement is. It doesn't matter if it's science or high philosophy or whatever high ethical ground, high moral ground. It doesn't matter. If it's not God, you will slide down to unrighteousness. You see the relationship of that? And so the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, listen to this. The wrath of God is focused towards the symbiotic partnership of ungodliness and unrighteousness. But then it doesn't end there. Can we go to the next one? So it's sin, symbiosis. And then when that happens, because you're so guilty, you will now try to develop your own version of spirituality. By the way, every single day there, there is probably a new spiritual religion that's birthed. And if it's not registered, it's still born. And humans are very good in concocting a brand new religion. Some of those do not have names, but it's spiritual religion nonetheless. Because the moment you go unrighteous, you will have to have a guilt covering. Because you know that something is not right. And so in order to make it right, you turn to human manufactured way to reach God. And so you concoct spirituality. You know, I heard a, um, a, a, a comment a, a, from, from a good friend in Manila that the problem with people like us who follow Jesus is that we are obsessed with the nomenclature Christian like are you dating him? is he even Christian? what? is he not Christian? we are so caught up with the terminology Christian wow she's Christian wow Christian I said, what do you mean? Is there anything wrong with that? Well, the first believers were called Christians. Yeah, I get that. But isn't it? Isn't it that it's so overused, this terminology, Christian? We don't even know what it means. Because, because in the first century, we need to understand that the Christians were called Christians because of one thing. And that, listen, listen. It's not... It's not because of their spirituality. They were not concocting their own. They were not reinventing their own spirituality. You know, you know, they are Christ-like. And that's why they were called Christians. Is this better? Are you dating that Christ-like dude? My goodness, when I see that dude, he reminds me of Jesus. Oh my goodness, you're marrying Jesus? Yeah. Well, I wish my wife would say that about me. Like, have you seen my husband, the one who, look, the one who walks like Jesus? Like, have you seen my husband who's a Christian? It's, it's, Christians are like, like so misused. And so, what's, what bothered me is, is it's true. 
We are so caught up with being, making sure that he or she is Christian without making proper assessments about the Christ likeness, which is the most important thing. Because in, in, in our text today, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now this is where, again, the nuance of language is very helpful because you will not see that in the English translation because in the English translation is this. Ungodliness and unrighteousness is, is, is done by men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So that, that is very good English, but it's a very poor translation. I'm not asking you to, to go deep in, in linguistics and study Greek, but I, just so you know that there is such thing as a cognitive, cognitive tense. I don't even know that term, why it's called cognitive. But, but this is a, a specialized terminology that basically tells us that what's being said here is that the truth is has this nuance of currently being suppressed and then extensively being suppressed and non-stop being suppressed and exponentially it's going to be suppressed and largely it's going to be suppressed even more did you get this back in my era it was not as suppressed the truth of the gospel and then added 10 years oh my goodness and now 2019 all of this being suppressed and 10 more years ah oh my goodness the truth oh it's like oh my goodness it's really like being suppressed now your grandchildren i can't imagine because if if this is the word of God and it's telling me that the truth, the person and the order of God will be suppressed by the spiritual climate. And that is the context of the gospel. And that is the reason why Paul is saying, no, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the only hope to stop this crazy suppressing of the truth. Because it's really getting to be really scary for my grandchildren. I, I'm looking at us. We are feeling the suppression. But add 10 more years. Add 20 years and I don't know how our kids, our grandkids are going to meet up with this opposition. But then we have a responsibility. And then the Holy Spirit is cheering us to do our stuff, to prepare the future generation for such a time like this we are currently being raised. By the way, there's a lot of optimism in the Word of God. It's just that it lays down the groundwork and the context that this is what it is. Please do not shudder in fear and do not go in a little corner and, and shake like this. Oh my goodness, it will be suppressed. Don't do that. We know it's going to be suppressed and in escalation and exponential form. But we have been told. But then what are we going to do? That's the reason why we are being told that the wrath of God is against this. Hmm. Now do you know what the wrath of God is? Now that's our safety bomb. Without the wrath of God, the suppression shall win. But with the wrath of God positioned against the suppression of the truth, it doesn't even stand a chance. For so long as you are on the side of God, 
For so long as you adhere to the person and the order of God, you are in a very safe place. But shudder now if you are part of the suppressing gang. Because it's just a matter of time. The wrath of God is already upon the agents of suppression. And it is only by the mercies and the grace of God that is holding them by a very thin thread. Very thin thread. God is the one holding them. It's not even them. And if you turn not for the hand of God that's holding them by a thread, all those who are suppressing the truth will fall speedily where they belong. That's what God is saying. And so we think, where is God, my goodness? There is this crazy wickedness in the year 2019, but where is He? Is He in the toilet or CR, as the Filipinos say? I've been waiting. Where is He? Don't look at Don't misconstrue the delay of God as we it is grace, it is mercy, it is patience, it's giving time for the wayward to consider the ways and their, and their godlessness. But there might be some repentance for our relatives and our friends and our loved ones who have yet to take the gospel of Christ seriously and throw themselves completely to the Redeemer and say, I'm bankrupt and I need you. I need your blood to cover my sins so that I might be set free. So where do we go with this? Very simple. There is a call for persistency for a fierce kind of godliness. We are told, Jesus once said, if you say that you follow me, if you say that I am your God, then do this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and then with all your strength. Now let's look at these four. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now how can practical application? I'd, I'd like you to put on your thinking caps because this is practical. How can I be persistent? How can, be, how can I be fierce? As I position myself with God in this ungodly age, how can I position myself with God and be persistent in my godliness in the affairs of my heart? Now, this is a fact. Heart is heaven. This is. <laughs> I was at Starbucks at five o'clock. I was gulping uh, a Quan uh, flat white. <laughs> this is the issue that I'm awake here. And, and I met my African American friend. He's like a, a super intellectual who studies at the University of uh, Texas here. And uh, he's a man of God. And he, he's, I'm constantly on Sundays, I'm, I'm there, and he's earlier, he's there earlier than me. And he's reading philosophy books because I think he's, he's about to graduate with a PhD in philosophy, but he's godly. And so I always pass by his table and, and, and exchange notes, and, and I get blessed all the time. But this time it was his turn to, to stop me because I was about to leave the church. And I said, uh, Brother, 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 wait. I said, What's, hap what's happening, brother? I said, What's happening? Ah, I need your counsel. Are you a married man? Of course, I said. Ah, I have a thing in my heart. Ah, I think I'm in love. Sure. Maybe it's just me. Or 
because I'm not used to this, I've never been in love, because it's some kind of a nerd. <laughs> she's not sure. He operates here, always. Oh, high tops here. Like super genius. But he said, I've never been, I've never been in love. So how do I know? How do I know if it's her? Because she, she's kind of very intellectual, so too. So it's time, it's time, it's time we talk, we talk about algorithms and, and atoms and whatnot. So how do I know she's the one? Because I've never felt this way. Like, I've never felt this way with another woman. But when I see her, you know, I get nervous. And my hands get sweaty. And uh, I can't say anything. I totally lose it. And then she goes, is that love? And I go, man. I said, let me backtrack. Let me see. And that happened to me. Yes, it did, I said. It did. It did happen to me. But, but, but you know, that was not the basis, I said. That was not the basis of me being convinced. Because if that was the basis, I said, I, I don't think I can, I can bank on my affections because my affections have, have short-circuited my decisions several times. I, said, I cannot trust my heart because it, it, it takes me in several directions a lot of times and, and I regret a lot of my decisions because I kind of like trusted my heart. I said, so, so what do you trust? I said, you know when I was kind of deciding if she's the one or if it's just the sushi that I ate? <laughs> uh, you know what? I really went down in prayer, like long time prayer and, and, and worship. I just went to God and I cried out to Him. I said, God, I don't know anything about marriage and courtship all that, uh, making this thing work, but you know, as so I need to attach myself to you, as I said, I, 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 I majored in prayer and worship. So my question, so did it work, he said, my goodness, it became personal. But when I focused on God, and gave him my heart, I began to see things that I've never seen. And got validated that she is the one. So what did he do? He said, he said go to a little corner. I said, and worship God. And just go there and worship God and sing your songs. And, and, and throw yourself wildly to Jesus, I said. And do it every day. And then, because if there's one one thing that I learned after these 30 years of being married, it is this. That marriage is a, is a marvelous, beautiful gift from God. And I have nothing to do with it. I have nothing to do with it. And I shall have nothing to do with it. Because it is the marvelous work of God. And, and the only way that this will work is if I will throw myself wildly into the arms of my Redeemer. And then he'll just tell me which way to go. That's why I'm still in love after all these years. My goodness, I just told my wife I love her. I said this morning, after 30 years. And I don't think it's going to be a big thing. It's exponentially increasing. I said, and I have nothing to do with it. Because I'm aging, and she's aging. But why am I in love with her? Because I think the habits of my heart to throw myself wildly towards God is helping me a great deal. And then, and then he looked at me, and he said, Man, you are the prophet of God. I said, who is he? I think he's in the Bible. I'm looking up, Mr. Prophet the Gabos. <laughs> and then he said, You are a person who can really impart wisdom to a younger man. So, so that's what it is. 
Uh, how can you persist godliness in the matters of heart? I think it is very simple. It's this. Uh, do an inventory of your personal time of worship. Uh, sometimes you call it quiet time. But what do you do with quiet time? Is it in the great white throne? You have your Bible in the toilet? Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, you meet with the most important being in the universe and the CR. In the toilet. You sit down there. Is that how you meet with the most important person? You're courting someone and you tell that someone, I mean, let's meet in the CR. No, how do you do that? Now, what do you do in the quiet time? How much time do you love? Is it the rush? Two minutes? Twenty minutes? But what? Be honest. Because if you're logging your time, you know that the habits of the heart directly affect godliness. Because if you're not ready with your heart, heart is going to take you in different places. And it's not superintended by the God of your heart. But by mere orientation from somewhere. Second thing is, how do I get persistent godliness in my soul? So what's the difference between the heart and the soul? Uh, this is a a, 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 a category in itself because soul is the seat of your ambitions and dreams. It's, it's your purpose. This is where you imagine yourself to be. And so it's precarious if you do not have godliness in the affair of your soul. Can you imagine this? If you do not have God in the affair where, where you actually uh, look at, at the imaginative uh, concepts of where you want to be or what you want to become. And, and this is where confusion happens when you're not anchored godliness in the soul. Uh, because you can all, you can have 1,001 different imaginings of who you ought to be. And the only way to focus is if you develop godliness in your so, you know what's the get to go to uh, uh, soul a determiner for? I'm not generalizing. I'm just observing. I may be wrong, but I think I'm right. The millennials. You know what their single most high end determining factor for soul searching when they're looking for ambition. What I want to be in the future, what kind of enterprise should I enter in, what type of career. You know what their go-to think tank is? Listen. Netflix. Binging. Yes. I was in a group of net Netflixers. <laughs> They're godly men and women people. And probably one of the godliest young people that I've met in Manila. And, and we were in this Chinese restaurant, we're eating uh, these noodles at 11, uh, close to midnight. And, 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 and they were just kind of like enjoying one another. But of course the guards were drunk and Jesus was no longer the topic or whatnot. There were no Bible verses, suddenly, conversation system to Netflix. <laughs> and I was kind of like lost in the ocean because this, I could imagine the, the number of titles that were being thrown on the table and the script, I mean verbal scripts that were being repeated. Like there were verses from the Bible and they were laughing. I couldn't even relate because I don't even know what films these are. And they would repeat it and they would laugh. <laughs> By the way, there's no exegesis of the verses. They just repeat it. Huh? They just repeat it. And, and it's kind of like, this is dangerous. Is this what social scientists tell me? That 
back in the days, I mean, I'm dating myself. Uh, you know, I'm 58. Back in my era, when I was a millennial, <laughs> we, we read books, and if we want to impress the girls, we would huddle up. We would huddle up, and we would talk about the books. And the girls, oh my goodness, really? And they would participate in the discussion of the books. And, and there's a lot of opinions, of course, to be sure, a lot of commentaries about the thoughts of this author, and there's going to be interaction that I'm wrong, and I would argue back and forth that I'm right, but it calls for a wonderful evening. And I can imagine going back in the time of C.S. Lewis, they had a group called the Inklings, and all that they ever did for an entire day was to talk about a little paragraph and go crazy about that. Hmm? And then I listened to the millennials in Manila, and there was none of that. This social scientists say that there's a big difference between reading books, reading books when you read books, it enlarges the brain matter. Mm, 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 mm. When you read books. But then, when you binge on television, <laughs> it becomes passive. It freezes your brain matter. And you are paralyzed in conceptual thinking. Oh my goodness. Is that probably the reason why they're just repeating the script? And there's not even any commentary. <laughs> Fast forward. Because the kids in the future, my grandkids, what's going to happen to them? And so, persistent godliness in the soul, how am I going to develop that habit? The soul, do you get this? So huddle up. Look for persons who are reading. Are you reading? What are you currently reading? Huh? Come on, let's read the book of Romans. And then let's meet regularly. Let's just think about this thing. Or, or, or go to a Christian bookstore and look for a good author. And then, come on, let's read together. And let's just exchange notes on what this thing is. Because I don't quite get it. I'm wrestling with this. Be persistent in godliness. And then, and then you'll have the caps, the thinking caps on where you go from here. And do not allow the cultural orientation or Netflix. I'm not saying that you stop watching Netflix. Because you have to know what the culture is is thinking. But you know, I, I hope I'm not overdoing this, but I'm just making a point here. Do not allow the cultural orientation to tell you where you ought to go on matters that are so crucial, like marriage and career and vocation. Mind! Let there be persistent godliness in the mind. Again, this is so precious because this is where you actively interact or argue or re rebut or, or correct or affirm an occurrence. I was in the Philippines and, and I, I did a lot of this engagement of the minds but one of my high points was engaging the mind of one elderly, one elderly, and I was, you know, in my readings, I happened to know that an elderly person, and I'm nearing elderly, <laughs> nearing that elderly thing, that the, the, the primary developmental need of the elderly is the validation that their life was worth, that it's validated because they matter. 
I say my conversations with the elderly in, in Manila and the Philippines where I was, wherever I was interacting with the elderly, I would always ask God, would you please grant me not a flattering speech, but a sensitive spirit in making sure that I validate the elderly. So I'm going to do it right now. Who are you doing? I want to talk to you, sir. I've never met a man like your son whose conscience is so like Christ. A single man whose conscience is so like Christ. Thank you, sir, for raising him well. Are you elderly? Yes. But, but he soars on wings like eagles, and the Bible says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will run faster than the religions. <laughs> and we do this. So, heart, soul, mind, and the last one. I want to focus on this. Strength. Be persistent in your godliness towards strength. Why do you think it's on the last position? Obviously, humans have the propensity to reserve what is the most strong to themselves. I shall reserve my best strength for me. <laughs> I shall reserve the most delicious pie for me. I shall reserve my best resource for me. And God is saying, I did not warn you to be like that. Joy, joy, joy. And the beauty and the depths of joy is the reason why I crafted you. And may I remind you that joy happens when your best strength, your most precious resource, your most precious skill sets are offered towards the kingdom and God's glory. So do an inventory. What are your best skill sets? Are they being used for the advance of the kingdom? What are your best resources? Are they being used for the kingdom? <coughs> I just came from Negros Occidental and Brother Dexter and Rose are there. And then they were team teaching. David Delight and myself and Brother Dexter were team teaching. And I was overwhelmed because initially there were 15 pastors there. And swelled up to 47, I think 50, I think. And we brought books. And we were having a, a big time uh, problem logistically because we are supposed to feed them. <laughs> in the entirety of the seminar and the conference we were teaching. And we were going to bring books and all that. And uh, where are we going to hold it? Because it swelled up to about 50. Uh, a pastor from Kabangkalan were there. Thank you, I think Grace. I think you're here. Send them the over, I love them. And 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 pass it from Spanley for hours away. They 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 rode the motorbikes just to be in the conference. And and, and so and, and so we were having this thing, but we prayed and, and providentially uh Elder Glenn uh, was having this casual conversation with an elderly man who was visiting uh Dallas. It's from Houston. And in their interaction, I don't know how the conversation reached that uh, I was going to Negros Occidental. And what are the chances that the man, the elderly man that he was talking to, was from Negros Occidental? And what are the chances that that man from Negros Occidental owns a first class resort that has a huge conference room? that can house the pastors for free. Oh my goodness. And after the conference, we took pictures. And I think Elder Glenn just showed them the picture. You know what he said? There's a lot of pastors. Why did you tell me that there's a lot of pastors? He didn't say that. <laughs> you know what he said? When he saw the pictures, oh my goodness. Let's do it again next year. Mm, Send them back. Ah. 
That's the strength force. And I tell you that elderly will never lose his joy because that's where it has to be. So, my brothers and sisters, if I'm going to encapsulate this, this is the thing. Strengthen our conscience over and above our orientation by inviting each other to take our attempts to be holy with seriousness within Christ and His work. Let's share towards one another where you are in this equation. And then ask for prayer, ask for affirmation, ask for encouragement. Because the work of Christ is finished. We just have to receive it. But we need to push each other. We have to honor each other. We have to build each other up. Do you get this, people? Do not remove God from any of your equations. Just like the rest of the world, do not go there. Do not remove God. Our Father in heaven, help us. We need all the help that we can get. May Christ be at the center. O Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, reign in us. In Jesus' name, amen.